So this is a painting that I made, and it took me probably about 10 to 15 hours. I'm going to reduce it down to about a 30-minute video. One of the things I'm trying to do is build up the textures a little bit more in the surfaces, and in order to do that, I need to show you some of the materials that I used when I was painting it. I use a combination of alkyd oil paints, which dry really quickly, and that allows me to build up a surface. And I also use mainly Blick soft mixing white, and sometimes I include other colors with it that are alkyd paints. If you want to get a sense of the palette that I use, please just pause the video and look at the colors that I have laid out here on the palette. The next thing is that I use bristle brushes. And the same thing with the bristle brushes, you can pause the video and see the sizes that I use. I also get those from dickblick.com. Now, I soak the brushes in walnut oil and I have a thin painting tray that I use to sort of prop the brushes up and I keep them in there. That way I don't have to clean the brushes after every use. It also keeps the paint fresher because the walnut oil uh, slows down the drying time in the brush. And walnut oil adds a nice sheen to the paint as well and mixes well with the alkyds. In this next section, what I'd like to do is show you how I use Photoshop to manipulate the image before I begin painting. In this instance, what I do is I take an image that I found on Tumblr. Uh, I do plan on changing it significantly in painting. One of the things that I do first is I um, size it on a grid. And in this instance, the painting I'm going to make is 16 by 20, which in terms of its ratio translates to um, 8 by 10. The grid itself is 600 pixels tall at 72 dots per inch. And what I'll do is I'll fix the, ba the background up so that it matches the same sort of darkness, rearrange the composition, and then I'll run a series of um, adjustments on it. So one of the first adjustments that I'll run is that I will use the value structure part to level things off and to work on the shadowed areas a little bit so I can see a little bit more of that. So I go to um, levels and what I'll do is I'll pull that slider that's on the right hand side till it peaks a little bit and see how I get it. And then I'm sliding the midtones up a little and see how much more um, information there is in the shadows than was before. It also sort of adjusted the color for me in some ways. Then I run basically the factory default setting for Smart Sharpen, which makes it a little bit clearer and a little bit sharper. And then I run another one called Smart Blur. So pause the video if you're, you know, if I'm going too fast here, I've sped the, the whole thing up <laughs> probably about 300 times so that I don't bore the hell out of you. And then I save it to a folder that I have on my desktop, which is different, called um, Current Paintings. And that way I can always find the painting or the original reference material again, because sometimes what I like to do is let the painting dry and then go back and look at it later. One of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind is that even though this image in itself is pretty cool, I want to do a whole bunch of adjustments to it once I get things going. And I want to change the drawing a little bit. And I want to do things like, I don't like his lips in this. And I want the beard to be more full um, and the arms. So I will do that once I make the drawing. Now, when I'm working, I like to use so much paint that I've been finding that pre-mixing the colors, and you can actually bag these colors in saran wrap uh, in between sessions, is a good idea. And so in this instance, what I'm do doing is taking two um, plastering knives and just smearing the paint across this glass coffee table top that I found is really polished and nice, and then rolling it into a ball and remixing it so that the color 
is distributed evenly and it almost becomes like a tube of my personal kind of base flesh color in this instance which is just a form of orange it's alkyd orange with some uh, dick blick soft mixing white and I mix up a super big batch of it and uh, sometimes I add a little bit more alkyd paint to it because I want the paint to tack up and dry and be able to ship the painting in two weeks if someone buys it and if you don't use alkyd and you work with thick layers of paint called impostos what will happen is it, it'll just be so mushy that you'll it'll take you six months to be able to ship it. So I've kind of figured out some of the chemistry. The other thing about the Alkyd paints that I get from CAS paints is that um, the colors are so intense. Look how bright and saturated that orange is. So that is probably sort of medium tone. Uh, if you're going from dark to light, um, and light being 10 would be white. I'd say that's like a, a number eight value. And so what I need to do is mix some of the darker values. And in this instance, I'm using some cadmium orange and some burnt sienna. Uh, the burnt sienna that I'm using, I don't really like as much, but my students leave behind paints or when I was teaching, they left behind tons of paint. You'd be surprised. And this happens to be Windsor and Newton student grade burnt sienna that I'm mixing with this sort of combination of a little bit of white cadmium orange and burnt sienna and you can see it's a slightly darker tone uh, i'd say it's almost like a 50 percent uh a number five in terms of the value structure and i'll use that after the light crests into the darker areas into the shadowed areas and i'll modulate those colors by adding other things now i start with uh burnt umber and uh with the burnt umber i just basically free hand draw grid. Uh, this grid's a little bit off, but I will correct the drawing later. And I also have in mind to make his shoulder and biceps a lot larger. I also want to do some things with his, um, with his beard and make it look a little bit, make him a little older. I, I just, you know, there are some things about that face that I don't like. And even maybe the cock of the hat, I'll change slightly because I'm not digging it. Um, so <clears throat> do as close as I can to a complete finished drawing. And then <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll clean my brush, add a little bit of black to that, a little bit of burnt umber, and then work from back to foreground. The reason why I tend to start with the darks and the background first is I know that that dark paint, I want it to be thinner. The darks are thinner where light hits it. I like to thicken the paint up a little bit more. And the other thing is it establishes pretty much a, the darkest dark and a tonal structure right away, but it also establishes the edges of the figures and the environment surrounding it. So here I go working out some of the um, drawing and also incorporating some of that black and brown into parts of the figure because I, that black that I'm using is actually an alkyd black that's a iron oxide black that when you mix other colors with it, it actually looks almost like a blue purple rather than just a straight gray that you would get with lamp black. And I'm going to first get the darks established in there, knowing that I'll go back over the entire painting two or three times. The bottom layer and uh, some of the grays that I'm mixing up uh, is just burnt umber and some white for the, the grays in the leather stuff that he has. And you can see it looks kind of warm, uh, leaning towards reds and oranges. Um, in context with the, the burnt umber and the black. But then as soon as you put down that orange, you can see it actually looks like a much cooler gray. So this uh, orange and burnt sienna mix that I'm doing are basically massing in the big dark areas and trying to think about uh, inflating his muscles a little bit and working out the tonal structure. Something that um, is really, really important uh, and, you know, two things, actually. You need to work the whole painting at the same time so that you pull colors from other areas into the into 
other areas so that there's a unity in terms of the color. But the other thing is, is that most flesh tones start with a form of orange and it doesn't matter what race the person is. Most people, because you have blood in your, in your body and then most light is kind of yellowish, you can start with a base of yellow or orange and then start working things out. People become addicted to the idea of talking about color all the time, but tone or value structure is much more important than color. In fact, the way your eyes are constructed, you have these things called rods and cones. The cones are shorter and absorb color. Um, the rods are much longer and there you have probably, I think, like 75% more rods in your eyes than cones. So value structure or shading is really initially more important than any kind of exploration of color, unless your whole thing in your painting is all about color. And a lot of abstract painters really think that way. But figurative painters, if you don't get the anatomy right, the drawing right, and the uh, shading or value structure correct, it's not going to be a good painting. With that in mind, I'm still a normal artist, so I'm addicted to talking about color. So one of the things that I like to do in the shadow areas, especially in this painting, is use um, pinks because they're kind of purpley in the shadows. And so that's what I'm going to do. And and what the light on this kind of um, photograph is called, it's, it's a photographic term or a cinematic term, is called rim lighting. And once the light is, you know, you'll see a, a sort of, outline of light along the left-hand side, but once it crests into the core shadow that you can kind of see that that shoulder is almost a sphere, it becomes, you have to drop the value down, but it also becomes a slightly different or cooler kind of orange, and it has a lot more pink in it, at least in this image, than it does normally. So you can see that there's a sort of burnt orange in among the crest just before the highlight and then the, the crest or the core shadow is a sort of dark burnt orange. And then the reflected light that's coming across his back and his shoulders is actually a little bit cooler and pinker. And I know pink is not a cool color, but in the context of this, it is because orange has yellow in it, which is warmer. Okay. And you'll see that uh, even in the um, in the highlights, I'll probably at the end add a little bit of uh, just either pure white or white with a with a dash of either black in it or uh, burnt umber to make it feel like a different kind of light on the left hand side. Now I start with the biggest brushes I can, then I move to a slightly smaller one. So I did most of the painting with a number twenty, and now I am down to. Um, a number six bright brush and I'm going to use that to basically redraw some things in. One of the things that I didn't notice until much later in the painting is that the ear on the right hand side is much too low. Um, some things about the structure of the head and the shoulders need to be worked out. So all of those things I keep in mind. Now I'm putting in the the cores of the the shadows, the darks, and those, remember, I want those to be a little bit thinner than where the light is hitting it. So the thickest paint will be the lightest lights, and the thinnest paint will be the darkest darks. Although, you know, sometimes I'll go back in and, and rework things like that leather armband and stuff to make them a little bit thicker and a little bit more tangible. See all that purple in the core by his cheek there? It's sort of like a purple pink really don't like the lips on this guy. It's kind of funny. Um, they're a little too insouciant, I think. So what I'm doing here <clears throat> is I'm actually uh, putting in the so-called highlights in the dark area. Now the rest of the painting is really just a matter of pushing back and forth and correcting small things like for example, that ear is way too low. It, his head is pointed down a little bit, his chin is down. So the ear needs to be um, at the same level as the eye, or actually slightly above it. It's only just a little bit away from the edge of the picture. So I'll end up fixing that. <clears throat> 
And what I generally tend to do is I just go back and forth with mixtures of burnt umber and black. Um, sometimes I'll introduce a little uh, Payne's gray into stuff, especially for his eye, and rework areas and push the darks and push the lights. Um, for a painting stick, I use this thing. <laughs> Basically, I use a broom handle that I lean against the bulletin board that I have the painting strapped to, and it allows me to stabilize myself a little bit while I'm painting. So I have the palette on the right-hand side to kind of give you an idea of what paint I'm grabbing and how I'm moving things around and what I'm adding. And of course, like I said before, it's really sped up. But you can see, for example, in the nose, <clears throat> and the uh, the rest of it, <clears throat> wherever there's a sort of pink uh, burnt um, sienna really works well as a sort of pink uh, flesh tone. Of course, I amp it up at times with cadmium red light. His beard and his uh, hair are a little bit red and pink, so I'm using a little bit of a combination of uh, burnt sienna and cadmium orange to, to boost that up. But the rest of it is establishing the darks and then reestablishing the lights. And, you know, like I said, over the course of 10 or 12 hours, a lot of back and forth happens with this. You get up, you go have lunch, you uh, um, come back to the painting in an hour or two after a dog walk or something like that. And, and I can really see all the mistakes and errors or things that I don't like about it. I do like to... Uh, <clears throat> make the painting more or less in one one day a lot of the time. But, you know, like this one, I came back the second day and did a little bit of work on it. Um, you know, because I like the paint to be sort of tacky when I'm working with stuff instead of reworking with dry paint. Now, in this instance, <clears throat> remember I mentioned to you that I really felt like I didn't like how his mouth looked in it. And you notice I raised the ear a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build the beard up and make it a, a fluffier, more textural kind of beard. And <clears throat> excuse me, in areas where the light is hitting things, I'm trying to make the paint thicker and thicker. The other thing that happens over the course of, well, I guess 24 hours in this instance, is that um, the paint will become dry and or tack up enough so that I can really put more thick layers on top of the under layers and it'll allow me to build up those pasty impostos that I was telling you about that thick layers of paint and getting up and, and getting away from the painting and, and doing some other things in the interim sometimes is helpful. The, I paint super, super fast, not as fast as this, obviously, but one of the things that's always um, been an interesting thing to me is when I was teaching classes, my students just didn't have the level of concentration that it takes to make a painting uh, very quickly. And it wasn't just about skill. It was about really just buckling down and uh, maybe listening to a book on tape or, or turning your stereo on or listening to music and just being willing to work on something for 12 to 15 hours. And so uh, obviously that's even one of the reasons why this video is really sped up because I feel like people just don't have the attention span to put in the time that they need to. And again, what I'd like to sort of mention is that um, it... There's this guy, Malcolm Gladwell, and he kind of talks about one of the things that makes someone really good at whatever they do is that they put in 10,000 hours. Uh, and I've heard this from a lot of other artists as well, a guy named Craig Nelson, who I believe teaches at the uh, Art Academy in San Francisco. He wrote an article or two uh, in which he talks about putting in brush hours, brush time, in order to solidify your skill. And when I was a, a younger man, I just didn't have the same level of concentration I have now. I'm 51. And um, I think that that may be part of it. But the other thing is, I mean, you even saw that I checked my cell phone at w once or twice while I was on there. Sometimes wanting to check your cell phone and using a computer to look at all the time makes you stop working at certain points. 
So I'm going to let you take a look at this. Uh, it's going to go silent or dead for a little bit in this video so that you can just watch what I'm doing. And one of the things I want you to kind of notice a little bit about what's going on here, there are a couple of things. First of all, I'm blending edges a lot. I'm also in the shadowed side working uh, some of the light areas to the darker core that runs sort of down the left-hand side like a crescent moon of his bicep. And I'm also trying to build the surface up more by adding more and more paint and making little decisions. Most of this is done with either a number six uh, or a number eight brush. But eventually, um, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start working with smaller and smaller brushes, working out some of the details and trying to work out some little things. At a couple of points, I'll pick up a sable brush and kind of work with that as well. I definitely want to leave some paint texture and allow people to see really the process of making the painting. Now, as I start working out the lights, uh, I generally leave the soft mixing white out, um, even without covering it sometimes, so that it thickens up a little bit. And you can see it's, it's a little dirty there on the left-hand side. It gets really tacky and thick, sort of like dried up toothpaste. And that's a good thing for me because as I'm working on the painting, I want the paint to get thicker. So the bottom layers are tend to be a little thinner, a little bit more watered down, uh, you know, with uh, some medium like walnut oil or liquid, sometimes even just turpentine. And then I just keep going back in and, you know, reestablishing things. In this instance, what I'm doing is I want the darks to be there. And then I also want some variation in tone in the leather, especially on the cap. And the cap on the uh, where the highlight's hitting it, I want that paint to be literally like uh, two centimeters thick or so, like a, like a quarter of an inch or, or, or more if I can manage to get the paint built up. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why it takes so long to make a painting. And I also think it's one of the reasons why painting demos can be so long and boring at times. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to super speed up the last, the very last part of the video, and you will be able to just kind of see the painting come together in the next couple of minutes. Now, what you're looking at here is the final stages. And uh, <laughs> I used to call it the potchking part, but that's Yiddish for just picking at something. And so it's the picky part. And what I'll do is I'll keep going back and forth between thin and uh, thick brushes, small and uh, large brushes. 
and put the last finishing touches on, eventually what will happen is you'll see that I'll build up the, the leather will be the last part that I completely work out and, and uh, I don't actually have that filmed here, so I'll just show you some stills in a second. But uh, I also went back in with the with a pencil <laughs> and went and etched some of the hair into the surface a little bit because I wanted the texture of the hair to really feel like hair. And I got that idea from watching a video on Rembrandt where he used the reverse end of a brush to just sort of sculpt out some of the hair. And one of the other artists that I really dig is Lucian Freud, who does, he uses mainly just the brush, but this is the last finishing touches to this painting. And then eventually it'll be done. And hopefully it'll be dry in time uh, for someone <laughs> who wants to buy it to get it in time. Thanks for uh, watching with me.